Please take your seats. I will ask our dear presenters to take their seats here. And the second moderator, Professor Bagire, kindly take your seat here on my side. Allow me before we begin the second session to introduce to you a few individuals. I will begin with our Monsignor John Baptist Kauta, the Secretary General to the Uganda Episcopal Conference. Monsignor, please stand up for recognition and most welcome. So that is our Monsignor Kauta. From the Catholic Secretariat, we have Father Fred Tsinjire, who is the Director of Lay Apostolate at the Catholic Secretariat. We have Father Benedict Birunji, the Chaplain of KIU, Kampala, University, Kampala International University. We have the representative of the Opus Dei, Reverend Father Alex Mbonimpa. Most welcome. We have the Vice Rector of St. Paul's National Major Seminary, Nyamaska, Reverend Father Francis Lubanga. Most welcome. And the Dean of Studies, Kenyamaska, Father John Baptist Chugundu. I think it's still for a break. Uh, our good presenter, Monsignor Philip Lokel, is he back? Yes. Monsignor Philip Lokel is the Vicar General of Cotido and uh, Vocations Director at the same time and the former formator here at Gaba Seminary. And last but not least, we have the Vocations Director of Moroto Diocese, Father Simon Peter Lokiru. Uh, we have also the Vocations Director of Tororo Archdiocese. Uh, the names I forgot. Yes, we shall get the names. Welcome. So I ask the presenters, please, if you are here, maybe I mentioned the names. Our beloved professor, Father Dr. Joseph Buchana Chisoga. If you are around, please take your seat, the other side. Um, Mr. Matega Antone, kindly take your seat, the other side. And we have our second moderator of today, Professor Bagire. And now, allow me to invite once again our Reverend Father Dr. Sebunya to introduce and invite the second presenter to begin. Our timetable has been adjusted a little bit. We are beginning at 11.45. We're already five minutes in the presentation. Up to 12.30 will be the, the second presenter. Then he will have 15 minutes of discussion. This will take us up to a quarter to one and we shall have an extra 15 minutes for the previous discussion, which we didn't complete. That will take us to 1 p.m. And I will announce what follows after one. So, nice attendance. Thank you once again, our MC, and welcome back, everybody from our well-deserved health break. I hope it was nice and refreshing. As you are told, we have in front of us cameras. One is rolling from Catholics Online. The other one is from Uganda Catholic Television. Maybe some of us don't know, now that Father Philip is here, that we have a Catholic TV channel which can be accessed on YouTube. Just to go YouTube, UCTV, you're going to view whatever is happening here, live and even beyond. Thank you, Father Philip, and the communications department of the Episcopal Conference. And I once again thank our previous presenter. I want to go with the rector's punchline. Remember the past with gratitude. We live the present with enthusiasm and look to the future with hope. Father Monsignor has helped us to experience the past, the glory, and the challenges of our past 50 years. But are we going to bask in that past glory and celebrate? 
Someone has said, the past is a stepping stone, not a millstone. You need to do more. Look at your past, get energy to go forward. Our next topic is going to help us to reflect on what we are going to do as we move into the next 50 years of St. Mary's. And the title you have is Situation Analysis, Dynamic Social Reality, and paradigm shift in priestly formation. And to lead us into this discussion, in this session, is another great son of St. Mary's. His profile is like 15 pages long, and I won't dare to read it as it should, but I just want to summarize it in three words. That our presenter is a priest, an academician, and an administrator. As a priest, he was born in 1962, just about when Uganda was being born. After his A-level, he joined the Katigondo in 1986 for philosophy, and later in 1989, joined this great institution of St. Mary's Gaba for theology. He was ordained priest of Ginger Diocese on 1st August, 1992, and we want to congratulate you, Father, for completing 30 years of solid, faithful service in the church. He served as a lecturer and formator in St. Paul's Seminary, Chinyamaska. As an administrator, our presenter was the director of research and dean of studies at Chinyamaska Seminary for a couple of years. He later became the coordinator and assistant registrar of Uganda Matters University, Mbale Campus, and currently, he's the academic registrar. Those who know what that means. The academic registrar of Uganda Matters University, Nkosi. As an academic and academician, our presenter has many academic accolades and publications. He holds diplomas in philosophy and theology from Katigo and Gaba. He holds the Bachelor of Philosophy and Theology from Urban University in Rome, as well as a Master's and PhD in Dogmatic Theology from the same Urban University of Rome. He successfully defended and published his doctoral thesis in 2001 under the title, Conversion of Churches as the Dialogue Reference for the Ecumenical Unity of Christians in Uganda. From the many publications and articles, I can sense that this thesis has been a springboard for many papers, articles, contributions, and to journals and books, as well as his lectures, including public lectures like this. He holds a master's degree in developmental studies from Uganda Matters University in Kozi. As you'll see, he has a special passion for research. Someone was asking for the tools to sharpen. I think that's one tool to sharpen as leaders. Research, social research and what's happening. And Father here has got a good experience of research and social issues as well as academic issues. He has directed over 120 diploma research papers, 550 master's research papers, 125 Bachelor of Arts research papers, and seven PhD dissertations. Today's topic is a fruit of this wide exposure in research and past experience as a priest and formator. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome in your midst Reverend Father Dr. Joseph Buchana Chisoga. Most welcome. As we told, he's a, an experienced lecturer. He's going to use the 45 minutes, and then we shall be responding and communicating. So meanwhile, write them down. He, he's a researcher, and he can compile all the themes. So that at the end, we shall bring them the results. Thank you very much, man. Man, you have destroyed me. <laughs> First, the maestro, and next the pupil. 
Father Silverio is my teacher. He's my maestro. He taught me dogmatic theology. Your Lordship, Bishop Muhirwa, Monsignor Kauta, Secretary General, Director of Government and Staff, Directors of Sister Seminaries and Staff, my fellow guests who include my boss, the Vice Chair of the Governing Council, Uganda Matters University, Professor Bagire, so I have to behave here. My dear seminarians, ladies and gentlemen, according to the invitation card I received, my session was to run for an hour and a half, and as such, I prepared. <laughs> Now the man is telling me that I have to do writing for the five minutes. We shall do what will be possible. Dear people of God, the topic I was given was situational analysis, dynamic social reality, and paradigm shift in priestly formation. I say it was because I had adjusted it and added in Uganda. Because if you leave a topic open-ended, then you risk expectations which you cannot provide for. <laughs> we are talking about dynamic social reality as the independent variable and that which becomes of the priest or the seminarian as the dependent variable. To reason around this topic, uh, by the way, before I go any further, I promise that this presentation is going to be a bit boring, especially at the beginning. This topic is not self-explanatory. Dynamic social reality and paradigm shift in priest reformation are not a detailing of situational analysis. Instead, situational analysis relates to dynamic social reality and paradigm shift in priest reformation as the function being applied to, that is, making a situation analysis of dynamic social reality, and then how that calls for a paradigm shift in priestly formation. Implied in this engagement is the understanding that if a situation calls for a paradigm shift, then all is not well. Why would you substitute a winning team? Why would you change a strategy that works well. So you can see bias beforehand in this presentation. It's not a, more, a mere explorative endeavor, but a descriptive and analytical one. In other words, my analysis is quite a half statement of the problem on priest reformation. And that is to say, I focus more on what is as opposed to what ought to be. Because that is where the search for paradigm shift may have to start from. In explicating this subject, a number of questions will guide. And these include, what exactly is the current social reality? How dynamic is that reality? Who or what are the agents of this dynamism? Are seminarians and priests simply innocent and unsuspecting victims of this dynamism? Or rather, 
Can they be unresolved weaklings and cowards being unable to surmount the ambiguities in the reality around them so as to minister to them and instead serve those ambiguities without ministering to them, obeying them without questioning them? In other words, can they instead be agents of that dynamism too? And what is the influence, even impact, of these realities on the seminarian and later priest? How then ought priestly formation to respond to this dynamism? Is a paradigm shift in priestly formation possible in the prevailing circumstances? These questions are too many and too big to be meaningfully addressed in a single paper like this one. However, they provide the spectrum within which the discourse will be shaped. The dynamism of, re of social reality can be examined from two perspectives. The first perspective is the one regarding how rapidly social realities are changing in terms of people's perspectives and actions, guided by new demands and expectations. And this creates a series of instances and calls for an equally rapid response so as to catch up with the times. Evangelizing by the use of social media is one such instance. Since service of God is also service of humanity, and humanity can only be served relevantly, service of God calls for relevance. And I do believe this is a, a significant locus of priestly formation already being addressed, perhaps needing more and more observation, listening, and creativity. The second perspective, and my main concern here, is the impact of social dynamism on the state of life of the priests and the seminarians, which leads us to problematize on the nature, state, and environment of priest reformation. Whether a solution can easily be got by changing paradigms is another matter, given that we are dealing with the human realities. In any case, any purposeful, systematic, and methodic chore will start with an examination of the symptoms of a phenomenon and the corresponding diagnosis thereof if any meaningful prescription is to be attempted. Remember, I promise to be boring. There is no doubt that the priest of today is a product of his age, a contemporary world which has become more critical of religious values and principles. Indeed, the 21st century can be regarded as the dawn of the new age, which was witnessed which has witnessed new descriptions and definitions of life in many ways, from traditional and orthodox understanding. These are expressed in the forms of new doctrines, morality, ethics, and values. Precisely, we are experiencing a new psychology, sociology, and pedagogy, and these are rooted in the new visions of sexuality and intricate ideology of human origin, existence and meaning, new crusades on freedom from religion, not freedom of religion. As it were, these new convoluted ways of seeing the world anew are being propagated by influential and wealthy personalities and institutions that allow a warm appeal to these doctrines and understanding with such high-profile ascent on the, these new doctrines, 
there is a towering attack on orthodox and traditional teachings of the church. Such challenges have had a penetrating influence on priestly ministry. The twin ideologies of secularism and relativism have posed formidable threats to the continued relevance of the priest in society. Relativism is a subjective way of approaching, viewing, analyzing, expressing, evaluating, and judging things, including the human person. Social-cultural relativism promotes evil, personalizing, and subjectivizing diverse cases of life because it proposes that each has its unique morality. Thus, each culture and person has texts which determine codes of moral, of moral behavior for it. The case of objectivity or general acceptability of moral responsibility is squashed. This deceptive trend tends to promote materialism as the doctrine because of its subjective tendencies. These phenomena again raise questions and queries and query the authenticity of priestly formation in contemporary society. Hitherto, the priest enjoyed high level clericalism and elitism in society. This can be argued to be the spin off of the ecclesiastical hegemony and religious dominance from the Middle Ages. While its effects had whittled down, in some parts of the world, particularly Europe and America, in Africa, the priest largely still enjoys a pride of place. Nevertheless, the whirlwind of secularism and relativism is so fast thickening that the priest's moral authority no longer rests on the institution of the church alone, but rather, additionally, he needs to justify the institution and the call he professes by the way of life and pastoral roles. It is a truism that priestly life demands honesty, integrity, and heroic self-sacrifice. But without proper discernment in the world of change, this might turn out to be a platonic adventure. Frederick Nietzsche's popular phrase that religion makes people docile and timid in the face of suffering and oppression is now fast becoming untenable, as well as that of Mark, uh, Karl Marx, that religion is the opium of the people. It is amazing that these challenges extend to the places where vocations to the priesthood are nurtured the seminary, and our parishes. Based on this reality, the church is struggling to deal with the increasing rate of change and expectation of the priestly ministry. In the words of Benedict the Sixteenth, how much filth there is in the church, and even among those who in the priesthood ought to belong entirely to him. This situation of paradox raises the question of the authenticity of priestly formation in the light of today's changing society. Moreover, it leaves a major challenge to the vocation. Arguably, there is the conflict of seeing the priest ministry, the priest ministry as a profession or occupation rather than a vocation. In the exercise of the priestly ministry today, some trends leave a lot of people to question the authenticity of their vocation, or at least the authenticity of their priestly formation. Some of these trends are highly opposed to what constitutes the tenets, the doctrines, and the teachings of the church, especially in the areas of worship, ethics, and morality, concerning life, marriage, sex, and gender. 
The new trends which raise the questions of authenticity of priestly vocation and formation are enormous. Although we can say that the major concerns of this oscillate around the celebration of the church liturgy, preaching of the word, living priestly life, and the practice of pure charity and love. The social reality. As humans, we live in a context that is filled with interactions which generate realities and experiences, both personal and interpersonal. So as we interact, we are both recipients and donors of interpersonality discharges in our social encounters. This is what social reality is about. Society used to be defined in terms of concreteness of boundaries and strict closeness of people and defined backgrounds and destinies. That is, a group of individuals involved in persistent social interaction or a large social group sharing the same spatial or social territory, typically subject to the same political authority and dominant cultural expectations. These days, the stretch of aggregation among people is very elastic and defies territoriality. Talking about social reality or social phenomena points to expressions which include the political climate and practices, economic production, consumption, consumerism and inequalities, economic crisis factors, which drastically alter the way in which people interact commercially and have a profound impact on their emotionality. Others are avarice, exoduses of people and immigrations, refugees, art and fashion, a very high cost of living, rampant murders, child sacrifice, land grabbing, corruption, degradation of life and human values, technological outburst, permissiveness and delinquence, drunkenness and drug abuse, abuse of religion and people's trust. There are also the social networks, a phenomenon of recent years whereby through the internet, through the internet, people communicate and share content more easily, even thousands of kilometers away. This is also the content of what is otherwise referred to as social dynamics. This social reality changes slowly or rapidly depending on many factors. This gives rise to the phenomenon of dynamism. Shalamwana, a Congolese musician, exemplified social expectations in relation to personal transformation. In 1996, she visited Uganda, and one of the places she went to to perform was Gaba Beach, just behind here. And while there, she announced that she was single and searching. But she gave the following conditions. If you are not handsome at 20, strong at 30, rich at 40, wise at 50, do not bother. The implication is that social reality is so diverse that one should be able to fit somewhere. In my language, they say, no munafu tabula kucha sobola. Even a, a weakling, a lazy person, will have something that they can handle. You know? You ought not to be a total good for nothing. 
in everything. You surely know the story of St. John Mary Vianney and how, so to speak, he was dense in class and was to be sent away a number of times. It came to a moment when he really had to go. And the rector calls him and tells him, you pack up and go. But you also know that it is said in the Bible that Samson slayed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. So in his fury, the rector says, John Mary Vianney, you are a complete ass. And John Mary Vianney says, Mon Pearl, Father, if Samson could slay a thousand Philistines with just the jawbone of an ass, consider what God could accomplish with a complete ass. The rest of the story we know and how wonderful John Mary Vianney was. Not in class in academics, but in pastoral. You cannot be a complete good for nothing in everything. Heraclitus describes the cosmos as being in a constant, a constant state of flux, always becoming. Everything is constantly changing and becoming other things to what it was prior to that state. This is objective philosophical knowledge of the world, which is in consonance with the scientific description of the physical and human realities. The priest, being part of nature, reacts and responds to its natural changing environment, mirroring this from the context of incredibly changing issues in the church there is a need for skilled and well-formed and informed priests to carry out the mission of the church. Is the change out there so fast but that by the end of four years here, a person is already outdated? Is such formation possible that would take care of such a speed? Because then, it would have to focus only on the far and not even near future, not to talk of the present. Problematization. In considering how to ensure the well-being of citizens in the public policy process, a distinction is made between a condition and a problem. A condition is a state that one can only bear without the possibility of doing anything about it. Before Dr. Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine, polio was a trauma just to be feared or born. Now it is a problem, a solvable one, and the governments only have to apply themselves to eliminate it. The darkness in our dark continent was formerly a natural to endure. With the discovery of electricity, concentration can even be put on rural electrification in order to solve that darkness problem. COVID-19 was immediately translated into a problem and many efforts were applied towards that, even though we lost very many people. Thank God, Ebola is turning into a problem that can be solved because it is beginning to appear that recovery from it is possible. All this implies that in the church, we need to problematize on the nature, state, and environment of priestly formation. Whether a solution can easily be got by changing paradigms, as I said already, is another matter. So actually, what is our problem? What is the problem? 
Jesus says, if a blind man leads another blind man, you know what happens. You can be a wounded healer, all right, but you cannot be a dead healer. That would be pretentious. Devasoga say, Navieranga or Tinomutu Alume or Muira. Omutu Alume is a man who has ever married, but now has no wife, has not yet remarried. But he is the same man selling herbs to other men to enable them to get, get wives. That one is a pretender in Abiyamanga. There are some vices which are sadly notable, even among the seminarians and the priests. Tribalism, theft, ritual murders, malice, struggle for positions to the extent of murdering real or imagined enemies, character assassination, syncretism expressed in terms of sorcery and night dancing, <laughs> witchcraft, both among those who do it and those who allege it as the first explanation of their mishap. Because if your first explanation of your sickness of your misfortune is witchcraft, then you believe in witchcraft also. The use of talisman to secure one's office, perhaps also among formators in major seminaries, except those who are here. <laughs> Devil worship, corruption, drunkenness, homosexuality, utter irresponsibility, and combativeness, among others. These phenomena are so reckless so intense, so rampant, and so heartless that they by far transcend mere human failure. They portray an attitude that has come to the realization that God is dead after all. Yet, the general quantitative state of vocations to the priesthood in Uganda is not bleak. If anything, it is promising. There has been talk of building a fifth national seminar. When I came here about a year ago, I found out that there was a house nine. I never left it here. Actually, that is where I slept. And I asked, when was it constructed? Of course, I could not ask why was it constructed? For fear of, of uh, an answer in the way the Germans would answer. Do me frage. Silly question. <laughs> when I went to Kinyamaska last month, I did not only find a new reality in the form of the old chapel turned into a beautiful looking dormitory, but also a new yet to be completed dormitory. These days you read about bumper harvest in some dioceses, ordaining tens of deacons to the priesthood at a go. This is indeed an encouraging picture. And that is why these dormitories are being constructed. St. Imbaga here used to be a diocesan seminary. It later, by default, became regional. And now it is quasi-national. Quantitatively, therefore, we project a reassuring and admirable picture of vocations to the priesthood. The major headaches are two. How to manage the numbers that come, both in the seminar environment and in the field. It is possible to be boastful of both quantity and equality. Is this the case in Uganda? We are living in the dispensation of Christ 
and the role of the priest is to reenact and further that dispensation. As a dispenser, therefore, he has to carry something in and with him. This is relevant because of the adage, name of that, called non habit. You cannot give what you don't have. Invariably, the question is, how can priests be adequately relevant in a world of constant change? It is crystal clear that society is undergoing changes through science and technological development, as we have noted above. Now, I would like to look, I skip something, and I look at what I'm calling disturbing realities in the priesthood. We are doing a situational analysis. The Italians say, I translate, one falling tree makes a lot more noise than the entire forest that is growing. Fine, but is ours just a falling tree or a really both noisy and smoldering menace? Jesus says, um, no, let me skip that one. One time, you know, I was the first um, coordinator of pastoral activities in St. Paul's National Seminary. And um, I was also training the deacons to be and the deacons in the practice of sacraments. So this was the sacrament of reconciliation, and we are practicing. So two people would go in the front. One is the, the confessor, the other one is here. And then after they would exchange roles, and then you confess loudly. After all, it is a fake confession. And then the other one also counsels loudly. In one of the cases, the penitent said, I stole the saucepans of the parish. <laughs> and uh, like you are laughing, we all laughed, including myself. It was funny, fine. Then later, a seminarian comes to me and asks me, do you know why everybody laughed? I said, I guess so. I also laughed. It was funny. He said, yes, it was funny. But that was not all. People laughed because in his case, it could as well be true. <laughs> <laughs> While every year in Uganda, Many young men had ordained the Catholic priesthood. Within the first five years of ordination, a certain percentage of those men fall into vocational crisis. A problem with alcohol, disorientation, disappointed with a life that was not of their imagining, or they just convinced themselves they need to take some time off. Some end up being sent for counseling. Some of them have ended up requesting a return to the lay state. For the parishioners they served, for the classmates, their pre-spirit, and obviously for themselves, such outcomes can be shocking and devastating. Relatedly, we have the current trend of some priests being projects gone bad or being mistakes. And this is worrying. A priest about one year only becomes tired and retired. Is that pre-existent priesthood and humanity which by the time of birth 
is already very old. The magnitude of cynicism is pathetic. Nothing seems to make sense. Everything becomes questionable. People do not know what to do with themselves. And how can they know what to do with others? There is nothing as disgusting and underwhelming as a young person who is without expression, zeal, ambition, life, then you are truly a mistake. But how can mistakes be, mistakes be so frequent in such a noble project? How did we get there? It is true we live in a quite provocative environment, but what does it call for if not understanding, patience, and coolness, and many times mere reasoning? Often you hear of a reactionary lot of priests and religious without any iota of control, and you wonder if what they went through can be called formation. One time, a priest was celebrating Christmas Eve, and you know how chaotic that one can be? You have so many drunkards outside there, and they are making noise. And uh, when he said, the Lord be with you, and one drunkard outside there replied, and with your mother. <laughs> you needed to see that that was the end of mass for this priest. The agitation he was in, the hurry he was in, and as soon as he blessed, rushed to the sacristy, just threw off the vestments to go raging looking for that old man. <laughs> and indeed, when he got him, he, he showered him with blows. But come to think about it, the Lord be with you, the Lord be also with your mother. What's wrong with that? <laughs> what, what is it? <laughs> so, the drunkard got a bidding for blessing the priest's mother. <laughs> the impression is so strong that by the time some seminarians are ordained the priests, they have already gone bad. They have already divorced. They are like couples, which by the time they are wedding, they have already divorced. This explains why some of them cheat on one another during honeymoon. A seminarian who divorces even before he's ordained, what is his conception of the priesthood? Do we perhaps have a problem here. You have a person who comes out as a priest, but immediately cannot stand community life and begins doing all sorts of funny things, being self-centered and making unrealistic demands. Some will complain about everything and about everybody except themselves when actually they are the real problem. And because you cannot run away from your shadow, wherever they are taken, the same reality surfaces. There is a big concern over the embrace of institutionalism versus internalization at a personal level, producing mere churchmen as opposed to authentic, humble servant leaders. Some people have alleged that Christ preached the kingdom and the church came out meaning that the church is an unintended wrong outcome. While this interpretation is unrealistic, wrong, sarcastic, and pretentious, there is a way it speaks to our behavior in reality. When Mahatma Gandhi says, I respect Christ, but I despise Christians, what does he mean? We shamelessly hide behind institutions. One time I went to Hoima with a motorcycle. It rained very, very much. On coming back, 
a classmate of mine asked to come with me to Fort Porto. We came riding, falling on our motorcycle. Somewhere we were at fault. I don't remember exactly how. And we were stopped by the traffic man. The first thing my friend said, going to them, we are priests. I felt that the, I should simply disappear from there, but my friend was, we are priests. You are at fault. You are a priest. One time, while in Miss Joachim, entering the chapel, there were so many of us. And people went talking. Some of us were in front, and we were signaling to them, shh, keep quiet, we are entering the chapel. And somebody said, we are priests. Then shame on you, if you are priests. One time, an elderly priest was driving a DMC. A traffic lady sees him coming. It's clear the Kaiser DMC stops him. He's very well dressed. The Kaiser DMC, in dangerous mechanical condition, the tires are worn off. Just for the license, it expired long ago. Just for the driving permit, it expired long ago. So this lady looks at this man, not knowing where to start from, and simply say, <laughs> and then another one is driving, is at a roundabout, and he's doing all those funny manipulations like this, and then the taxi driver shouts at him, Father! Father! <laughs> Masking has never gone away, and I don't think it is about to go away. Masking. They used to talk of levels of masking up to alloy. That, that one has an alloy mask, impenetrable. That people are in the seminary, and all they are doing is to hide. That which you are hiding means you are not sure of it yourself. And there is nothing as disgusting as having an elderly man or woman masking. That means you have lived all your life simply masking. And you have crystallized into absurdity. Lack of transparency. The bishop, as we all understand, has the duty and therefore the right to know the man he is ordaining. Bishops in general rely on the evaluation of candidates to the priesthood provided to them by the seminary formation team led by the rector. And today's seminarian understands well that appropriate self-disclosure is a key ingredient to a healthy and happy life, no matter what one's vocation. There is no friendship, no love, no genuine connection with others, no emotional intimacy without vulnerability. But seminarians know that they are in a, a bowel of source. There is in a, it's an environment of constant evaluation. Trust is difficult. Transparency in the formation environment obviously carries with it risks. The seminary formators are human instruments with their own weaknesses and imperfections. To open up to a formator being one who's with one's own imperfections, talking about a struggle, sharing about one's own weaknesses, opening oneself to advice and guidance, it all carries the risk of being hurt somehow. Will the formator really understand? Will what I'm sharing about myself somehow get misunderstood, misconstrued, or exaggerated? Or is it that I fear being forced to look squarely at a real and ongoing area of struggle in my life? Something that, in fact, might append the dream of priesthood. This man who disorganized me from the beginning is continuing, so I need to skip uh, certain things. 
we have a very big problem. Very big problem of the inside and outside of the house. The formators can do their best here. But how about when the seminarians go out of here? Counterproductive influence of the parish and diocesan priests on the seminarian. One of the greatest challenges of formators is to, is to face the questions of students regarding the difference between what is taught in the seminary and the lifestyle of certain priests they encounter in the parishes. Whom are they going to believe? Or panga bapangulula. It's unfortunate what is taught in the seminary is often referred to as a theory. That theory does not work. So you go out where you meet people who look like they have never been formed here. They have distorted everything. And that is more credible because it is practical. So a practical error is preferable to a theoretical truth. And that is very sad. And it confuses Samarians. And I can assure you, you can talk all the angelic words here. But the reality they see, that is their reality. And unfortunately, it has a corrupting efficacy that some even long for it. When am I going to get there? And uh, that goes together with the, all the errors, all the errors that are made. One funny WhatsApp message said, if you want to change the world, do it while you are still single. Once you marry, you can not even change the TV channel. <laughs> Likewise, if you want priests who will be ever self-conscious of who they are, Make them now. But there is another reality. How is that going to be? Seminarians are taught logic. And by the time they are ordained, most of them have degrees in philosophy. But make a mistake of applying logic to a priest in the field. They will kill you. <laughs> what has gone wrong? But they hold a degree. Your philosophy is lugesigesi. In the university where I work, the students we teach ethics are the very ones we catch cheating examinations. We are taught in the seminary how to celebrate the liturgy. There is even a booklet called How Not to Say Mass. To celebrate liturgy in the ideal way, we go out and follow those who have distorted it. So everything we are taught is simply ideal is a theory, does not correspond to the reality on the ground. Did Jesus not do what he told? Are distortions the ones which are practical? Is there no ideal of life? Is it distortions which are realistic? And this is quite a disturbing situation. I want to talk about what I'm calling intellectual mediocrity and the need for intellectual conversion in both the seminarians and the formators. We humans are intelligent beings whose worldviews are largely determined and guided by the mindsets of understanding and concepts. These mindsets are the openings by which we grasp the realities that are knowable through a series of experiential reasoning. They avail to us the matrices of knowledge that are reachable by the mind within the given set of horizons that surround us. At the same time, these mindsets are our limitations in so far as they set the possibilities and the range of knowing and understanding. We also know that our intellect has knowing at, as its formal object. This is what makes us curious and inspirational. It's also what makes us gospers, by the way. 
Intellectual growth goes along with the curiosity to explore, to discover, to create. If this natural path is not followed, one may find oneself slipping into illiteracy, an intellectuality, an ipso facto, vulnerable, naive, and gullible. And that is related to descent into semi illiteracy. You have seminarians who, as soon as they get home after completing their studies here, burn all the literature they had. That already makes them turn towards illiteracy with their degrees. Going beyond the formal and obvious meaning of knowing, uh, of, uh, knowing to read and write, illiteracy can be marked by a lack of acquaintance with the fundamentals of particular issues and errors that you might be dealing with in life. Factual, civic, perception, physical, mental, translative, argumentative, moral, and environmental, among others. These are people who will not read even a newspaper. The stage is set for annoying dictatorial ignorance naivety and outdatedness. How can it not be if you fail to update yourself? We do not have a reading culture, much less a writing one. A practice that would keep one on the tenterhooks of reflecting in order not to become prey to any cheap detractor. The doctrine we study is serviced not only with the practice of life, but also by further research and appreciation for appreciation. Little wonder then that some people, even priests, are easily turning into religious bats. When a politician leaves one party and joins another, you hear all kinds of names being applied to that person, as if a political party were a marriage or a religion. Now what shall we say about priests who keep jumping here and there, who give the impression that they received nothing to stand for so they can fall for anything. And we are talking about doctrine. These are the ones I'm calling religious bats and scandalous ones at that. St. Augustine moved a lot through pagan doctrines until he arrived at the real thing. So he will say, late have I known you Late have I loved you. But as we know, he really loved him. But how can someone who has been schooled in catechism, in the tradition of the church, in scripture and theology, be so easily uprooted? We saw this about two decades ago in Kanungu, where the tail wagged the dog. We are seeing it now at an even higher rate with the oak of memory and other confused deformations. And you can be sure there are those who simply have not yet manifested it. But inwardly, they are already uprooted. All these things cause doubts among people and society and lead to serious questions. They also provide material for our detractors to get capital out of. But the seminarians are supposed to get edif edification in academic rigor from their formators. And I want to argue that as formators, we fail them in this aspect. You have, have you ever experienced what happens when a breakdown breaks down? Professors, need to, to, to be producers as they apply theological principles to provide relevant strategies to bothering questions and situations. For instance, why do people leave the Catholic Church? Are you preparing people to become priests in an empty church? That is your direct concern. Why do we preach endlessly, but people do not seem to change by that preaching? These and the many questions posed above need to be delved into by the seminary professors. 
Seminarians can be made to participate in these researches. And then we have co-publications between them and the professors. Why? Because prosperity is about change. Transcendence is about concentration and effort involving a change of attitude. Priestly formation is about the right disposition in line with the discernment and docility to listen. In a way, it is about self-violation. It is radical change. How can you help anyone to transform if you cannot even change your mind and attitude? Just like universities ought to be engines of research for social transformation, so ought the seminaries to become centers of theological excellence and relevance. What we have, I'm sorry to say, are professors who read others and prepare their lecture notes, and the seminarians who labor to cram what has been passed on to them. Our professors of theology, and I've been one of them, teach fundamental theology in the major seminaries, using notes which were prepared by a team of Bible and theology professors of Kachevere Major Seminary in Malawi, way back in 1974. And that's what we are still teaching. <laughs> what is in there is a very important matter. It's true. You may not change it, but how many years down the road are these? How much change has taken place, even pedagogically alone? And that is only one of six volumes that they prepared, covering the entire salvation journey from revelation to eschatology. <laughs> How many Bible and theology professors have we had in Uganda over the last, say, 50 years? But on the other hand, maximum productivity must be aided. It does not simply flow naturally. The apostles say, it is not good for us to leave the preaching of the word and resort to distributing food. The apostles were not themselves to starve or shun serving others while they still spent time looking for their own well-being. It must have meant that they too would be beneficiaries of the same service of the deacons. Just like a seminarian or priest can be in the chapel supposedly meditating when actually there is a marketplace in his head, so also can a, 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 a formator be here in the quiet of this place when the heart is full of tribulation. How do you expect him to offer beyond regurgitation? Social change has exposed the priests and religious to sharing unfavorably in the problems of their families and society at large. Education is expensive, and yet it is the order of the day. Many priests struggle with their close relatives in matters of education and health, among others. And as you are contemplating ignoring your relatives, you remember those times that you have seen a fellow priest ailing, practically neglected by the, by the diocese, and is being looked after by a relative. Then you surrender. You continue with the Lord. When the bishops are pleaded to regarding the financial plight of formators, they simply rebut, saying, you are better off than your brothers in the parishes. <laughs> but for heaven's sake, I am in the university now, and there is a way things go. Don't compare me to somebody who is in the parish. If you want me to sit and do research, that cannot just be because a uh, uh, father in is providing me with food. That's not enough. The result is that you cannot have satisfactory productivity. What I understood by the situation analysis analyzing the situation as it is, what is. Have you ever heard of what they call the nothing people? Some of us are nothing people. 
I came across this poem written some decades ago entitled The Nothing People. They will not rock the boat, but did you ever see them pull an oar? They will not pull you down. They will simply let you pull them up and let that pull you down. They do not hurt you. They merely will not help you. They do not hate you. They merely cannot love you. They will not burn you. They will just fiddle while you burn. They are the nothing people. They do not lie. They just neglect to tell the truth. They do not take. They simply cannot bring themselves to give. They do not steal. They scavenge. The sins of omission folk, they are neither good nor bad and therefore worse. Because the good at least keep busy trying and the bad try just as hard. Both have that character that comes from caring, action, and conviction. So give me every time an honest sinner or even a saint. But God and Satan, please get together and protect me from the nothing people. Let me skip because uh, I'm sure the man is uh, <laughs> let me skip and go to <coughs> what I'm calling some prospects. Some prospects. It would be pretentious to say here is the new paradigm of seminar of priest reformation. To be pretentious. By, but by hitting on here and there and there, in a way something takes form. Here are some prospects but which cannot be said to constitute paradigm shift. Would one be off the mark to speculate that our combined handling of the seminarians, especially at the lower levels, makes them lose self-esteem and reduces them to mere survivors and therefore later on substantial burdens? Is it probably not time to examine our approach to bringing up priests to be, considering them as children in a family and encouraging them to share open land freely without them being suspicious and apprehensive that they are committing suicide by doing so. I saw recently on social media uh, three girls all impregnated by a houseboy. Three daughters, all impregnated by a houseboy because the parents treated them like prisoners. They were not allowed to get out. And if they're not allowed to get out, all they have in there, Ichiba Oshimala. In education in general, we are now talking about new pedagogies in learning, more sharing than simply banking. Confirm Paul of Freire in the book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Role playing, midwifery, confirm Socrates. And I would like to argue that we have a generation that is generally devoid of confidence proper ambition and fairness. There is a lot of try and error, gambling and mediocrity. At home in the earlier years, some are jet pushed to the professional desires of their parents. I have had two occasions to struggle with young men in their late 20s to persuade them to leave the seminary. After making it clear to me that they were struggling with the vocations of their mothers. Even worse than that, I made friendship with a priest from one of the countries in Africa. He was such a man whose tongue had little control of itself because only after days, he told me that he was leaving the vocation of his mother. 
he was waiting for his mother to die so that he would get liberated like the platonic soul after the corruption of the body. He could not be the killer of his mother. That's why he was there, to save his mother. And the mother of all shocks to me was that on going back to his country after completing his studies, he was made director of a major seminary. Based on the above discussion, it emerges that there is a need for an approach to formation that can cause phenomenal change in young people's lives, resulting in a social transformation of their entire life in areas like enhancing their confidence, creating awareness about their value in society, and enhancing self-esteem and self-efficacy, among others. Conceptualizations and models of priestly formation have been oversimplified and focused on a hanging spiritual dimension not anchored in balanced personality. This parallels the mente sana in corpo sano dictum. The spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius are important, all right. Meditation is important, all right. The liturgy of the hours is important, all right. Visitation to the Blessed Sacrament just before lunch is important, all right. And of course, the Mass, all right. But they can remain mere superimpositions, plenty of rain falling on a rock because there is no disposition there unto. Saint Augustine tells us that grace builds on nature, and you can add nature. Families and society put a lot of wrong ideas in young people. Does our formation promote and create confident people? People who know that they are free, empowered, with the capacity to be many things, and therefore have expect a spectrum of choices around which they can make contributions to themselves, their family, and the entire society without seeing that they have been bewitched to the priesthood and so must do whatever it wrongly takes to get there. When, my, when, I, when I told my mother I wanted to go to the seminary, she said, no. And I said within myself, I will go and for the rest, you will sort yourself out. And that's what I did. And it was up to her to convert, not me. That's why I cannot understand that a man of 28 years tells you his vocation is that of his mother. What kind of fake man are you? <laughs> you know? I have always been very sickly. Now I'm a lot better. But when I was in the seminary, I was very, very, very sickly. I went for pastoral spiritual year. <laughs> the same thing continued. Now our year is when we started getting three recommendations coming to the theologicum from the parish, from the vocation director, and from the bishop. The one from the parish was very good except illness. The one from the vocation director was very good except illness. Now the one from the bishop. With the Mzungu's interpretation about falling sick means you have no vocation. And this is what he stated. I have doubts about this man's uh, psychological balance. <laughs> I think he's psychologically unfit and if he continues falling sick, I, I advise him to quit the seminary. That is what Rector Kalumba read to me there. And like you have laughed, both of us burst out laughing. Now, I knew I was not going to stop falling sick. As a matter of fact, while I was here, it became worse. While I had a monthly period of malaria in Katigondo, here it was fortunately. 
So I knew I was gone. And I started making my plans, plan B. I knew this journey had ended, and I was planning something else. If I'm not being called, why must I think that priesthood is a matter of life and death? That is lack of self-esteem because you don't think you are capable of something, anything else. So while our society does not yet understand and appreciate the value of psychologists and psychiatrists, we probably need them now more than ever before. Our society is broken in many ways. Families are broken in many ways. The education system is broken in many ways. The church itself, so to speak, is broken in many ways. What do you want? And what do you expect? So according to me, we get it wrong if we assume that we are here to form and therefore must immediately embark on forming. There are underpinnings of brokenness that call for a kind of dismantling of the person, a deconstruction in order to reconstruct and then begin to form. Some formators are good role models. They accept their weaknesses and try as much as possible to give a good example of life to the seminarians. A seminary formator, by the way, should be a seminarian because he ought to be the first to submit the rules and regulations of formation. How could I not expect that? <laughs> Seminarians watch formators very closely. Before endorsing any principle or value, they consider the credibility of the person presenting, or representing or transmitting the value. Is he authentic, sincere, coherent, available, and competent? Can I trust my destiny to him? This means that they expect the formator to risk his own personal experience while taking into consideration their own individual experiences. Pope Paul VI put it right. Modern man does not listen to masters, but to witnesses. If he listens to masters, it is because they are witnesses. It is equally true that some enthusiastically welcome the model being enforced by Rome. No. No, no. Some formators do not measure up. No. It is equally true that some formators do not measure up to the expectation associated with their noble task. And that is why I am enthusiastic. And I really welcome the model that is being are enforced by Rome, having an institute for academics and a wing for formation. We often take it that whoever has done further studies can form. It is wrong. The psych, the psych will always remain the pivot and balancing line for answering one's call. If it is neglected, the information is wholesomely neglected. Indeed, the recovery, the rediscovery of the centrality of the formation of conscience will no doubt ascertain the possibility of an authentic discernment. As such, warding off partial and inauthentic responses to the calling. In all, there is a need to emphasize conscience formation. Conclusively, the very desire for transformation, the transformation of priestly formation, so that it can be meaningfully transforming of an individual, denotes a threshold to a new horizon identified with the scope 
of qualitative being and service. A critical revisiting of the tenets of individual and collective minds and intellectual conversion. It is also a process of self-transcendence and leads one to go beyond horizons to face new ones. It is to always have new beginnings, to be ready for the new thresholds to be encountered in the process of understanding, judging, postulating. It is, in the final analysis, a willingness to know better, to see better, to be better, to act better. This is what ought to be the highest and noblest benefit from priestly formation at the horizontal level, if the vertical level is to make much sense. At the same time, it is what constitutes the new paradigm par excellence of priestly formation. Lastly, I would like to uh, choose all of you, beginning with the bishop, of being very good listeners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I didn't tell them to stand. They just did it. And tells you what you've just done unto us and for us. And in their name and the name of the, all the audience that's online, I've got some very good comments on Zoom. Some people following us from the US and around the country, they have sent their reviews and comments. And this is very exciting that we are not only here, but we are all over the world. And the mantra is, Gawa speaks, Gawa is listening. Thank you very much for inciting us in this discussion. And this is Gawa. You know, we have to be, like he said, pragmatic and sense the sense time, um, the signs of the times. It is lunchtime, and Gawa is speaking. And my director is going to give us the program, as we said, to create a more ambient time for discussions and sharing. So I thank you very much. As I said, keep note of those views and insights that you're getting, especially that you're going to share in the wider panel when this session is done. I thank you very much for the opportunity, dear presenters, and all of you present. And I hand you over to MC. Thank you very much, Father Dr. Chivira, once again. Thank you very much, our dear, beloved professor, Father Chisoga. Some of us are very proud to have been taught by you. And uh, the issues you raise really touch us very much as formators. I think you should be a consultant. <laughs> and we truly agree with a number of the issues that you raised. So I think this calls for more dialogue and as a new uh, dynamic way of forming our young people. Uh, your presentation was irresistible. That's why I dispensed you from the time allocated. <laughs> so allow me to announce that uh, lunch is ready for all of you in the students' dining hall. After lunch, we shall have a break and we shall be here at exactly 2.30. Uh, we were meant to have the third presentation and discussion immediately, but I understand our chief guest, uh, Bishop, has another commitment. He was supposed to come last, so he will begin by his speech and presentation, and then that will be followed by the third presentation, followed by discussions, and time allowing, we shall avail opportunity for questions and other presentations. We already have questions and suggestions online. These are being processed and we shall pass them on to our beloved speakers. So I will ask. 
Yes, uh, we shall ask Father Kasaja, who is one of our spiritual directors, to lead us in the Angelus, and then we proceed for lunch. Father, you're welcome. Can I beg a student to take a microphone to him? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Pray for us, O Holy Mother, Mother of God. Let us pray. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, Saint Joseph, the meal, the, the grace, bless us, O Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. A good appetite to all of you. Hey, Father Professor Chisoga, I'm told the bishop is giving us a few minutes to be working on the questions. So, uh, Father Chisoga, if you don't mind, I have a number of questions. Some of them came online, and most of them seem to be addressed to you. So kindly, uh, we shall give you about 10 minutes, 10 minutes, but we still have time at the end. Um, disclaimer that I made the reflection does not mean that I have the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so, these are good for discussion for all of us to discuss. Otherwise, there are so many exams here in one. As far as I see, formation currently is full of timidities, whereby students are always followed as if they are children. Auto formation is dying off. Therefore, students should be given freedom and then be corrected in case of error, but not policing in each and every time. I think this is just a, it's a lamentation. <laughs> <laughs> proposal, so sure, and we touched on this. We did touch on that. The conflict between policies, laws, and regulations based on dictatorship and self personal expression of seminarians. There's a lot of separation of the real you of seminarians due to unnecessary policies. This can be discussed. Suppression 
Is that related to policing? Suppression by those who police? Those who police, you know, policing is a strong word, but there is a, a weaker form of it, which is part of the responsibility of forming, and which can also come because of lack of commitment by the person who is being formed. But also, like we said, we all need to get together and continue to learn together. Nobody has it all, but we need to continue to learn. To learn to handle even ourselves. Most of the problems begin with us. We don't know what to do with ourselves. How can we know what to do with other people? If you are not good to yourself, how can you be good to the others? You cannot give what you don't have. If you're not kind to yourself, how can you be kind to another person? So I think there is a lesson here for, for all of us. And maybe we also need to know that there is a part of God in this thing. And, uh, let God do his part also. I usually say, a God whom you have to defend is no God. He's so weak, he's no God. A God you have to fight for He's no good. He's very weak. So we do our part, but let's leave the part of God there so. Do, do not take it that you must, you know, bisect the person up to the soul and no thing that is going there. You know? Because action and reaction, the more you do that, the more they will hide. So we shall be helping them actually. To, 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 to hide themselves for the more, then we compound the problem. Uh, in your personal assessment, what is the quality of the priests ordained today in Uganda? The quality, I already made a lamentation here, that does not represent everybody. They are indeed good priests, really, really admirable priests, young and old, even, uh, even among the old, you find the irresponsible. Some of these things we are talking about, even the old are there. Those who got deformed, do you think a time comes and they reform? They continue like that. Like I said, people who, who mask. I know old men who are still masking. Old men. <laughs> you just wonder. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I will not mention anyone, but I know, I know some. So what, what do you do? It's like a akacha, mamela, that kind of stuff. So uh, it's difficult to talk about quality. We talk about, you know, activity manifests being. That's one of the first uh, metaphysical principles. So from what you see outside, surely. There are, there are things that a person, they, they, they tell us you cannot judge faith, you cannot. But St. James brings it out clearly. If I see you are a rude person, you are not kind at all. Should I call you a holy man? Really? No, that directs my mind somewhere else about you because of what I see about you. Living alone, these weaknesses that are common to all of us. There is development of technology and other aspects in the intellectual world. However, seminal formation has given no space to this change and that adaption, adaptation. How can I take my notes written with faults and errors for years in pastoral duties uh, when there is a possibility to be provided with a modern, soft or hard uh, perfect notes for future years. Question, how can we adapt to the modern world in the world of academia? Are we still at zero in this? I don't think so. Really, don't we have computers here? Don't we have internet? You have the smartphones? 
and so on. All the smartphones are for other things, as usual, for other things, not for serious business. But I would like to think that, uh, though not at the highest level, there are certain things you cannot resist. Like uh, technology now, you cannot resist. Because there are people who are, full, who are with us virtually. They are attending this on Zoom, that's technology. And the link was generated here, I think. Yes. So I think uh, uh, maybe somebody feels that everything, everything to the full should be provided and is not provided, therefore there is a problem. When he has a phone. But I would like to believe that if it were possible to provide everything, I don't think that this seminary, the bishops who would simply say we don't want to provide, no. So a minimum acceptable, workable is normally provided and we base on that to, 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 to go ahead. Pope Benedict the 16th claims, <laughs> claims that, uh, <coughs> that our era is characterized by relativism. I understand relativism as the hegemony of the individual, the individual becoming the source of the truth and the good completely opposed and closed to all outside voices, including that of God. Precisely, what do you propose as elements constituting a response to relativism? First of all, uh, the first part is not completely true. Uh, it is true, yes, but that is not all. That's not all, it's not just about the individual but also societies, cultures. One culture compared to another, if you are talking about values and so on, you know, don't judge. Ours is ours and yours is ours. This is our truth, this is our good, that is your truth, this is our morality, that is your morality. So not only individuals, but also groups and cultures. So what do I propose as elements constituting a response to relativism? Now, before I attempt that one, let me see, you talked about discussion. I don't know that this is your meaning of discussion, <laughs> that, uh, that somebody is tormented with all the questions alone. <laughs> but, uh, my, my <laughs> you know, because it's, It gives the, the, the picture of a know-it-all, you know, a know-it-all. And on the other hand, I can also look at, at it like, hey, why did you say them? You answer, you know. <laughs> but to me, a discussion means that we hand all these things, you know, all of us, and, and we share the ideas. If you don't mind, that's my understanding of discussion. Yeah? Oh, that one is coming later. Okay. And the uh, bishop is not yet ready? <laughs> Pardon? Ah, okay. But I move away now. This is Canada. Oh, I should hang on. Okay, on Zoom. It is time to open up Ugaba. Ugaba is closed. Offer some programs to Leite. Get them pay such that the seminar gets some money while teaching more people. Seminar programs can continue without disturbance. Secondly, Gaba can work together with Uganda Matters University to receive some courses offered at UMU. For instance, management, communications, education, this can easily be done online. Let's share that. Seems like it would be the rector to, to, to respond to that. But I was just telling somebody out there that in 2002, 2000, yeah, 2002, we worked on these programs 
you now have the, the Master of Arts in Religious and the Theological Studies, but it was not the only one. We had the diploma, we had that Master's, we had another Master's in Philosophy and, uh, and um, Development Studies, another Master's was in Social and Management Studies, something that I feel we need so, so much in the seminaries. We don't have studies in management. People go and gamble with the managing parishes and so on. The two never took off. The two never took off because the other one, they were secular. I think they were secular. And the idea was that lay people would come. And for Gama, it was suggested that outside, just outside the gate, where there is that building there, there could be a classroom there. And lay people coming, you know, you attend with them there. After that, they go away, you come back in here. Even that was resisted. So the two programs that we labored to design simply died off like that. And this is what uh, Father Molindua is proposing. He's also proposing you could work with the GABA, open up and have some lectures and so on. I think that one we simply leave to, to GABA and even St. Paul's. To, to reflect on. Honorable, uh, this was for, I think, Honorable who went, said, new times, new challenges, new answers. We need to find the new challenges. What are they today for seminary formation? I would do, I, <laughs> I didn't say this. This was Honorable. <laughs> but, but surely if I were to answer this, I would begin by saying, why would I have to find challenges? I already have too many of them, and I have to look for challenges to find them. You know? Unless the person means we need to identify them. Maybe that's what is meant. We need to identify them. And I think right here, we are doing a bit of that, of identifying the challenges. Um, leadership for a new society. You say leadership is everything. I'm now suffering for honorable. How can we prepare a better leadership for tomorrow? What is professional, has vision, set priorities right? I put here for discussion as uh, instructed by MC. <laughs> Gaba listens, Gaba speaks. We are in the synod of synodality. You have mentioned unity and solidarity. How are we to improve this unity and solidarity? Listening to each other, joining harmoniously together, growing and pruning with all. We, uh, um, I think there is a question and answer already given also. What are the gaps that we need to fill, cover, so that GABA at 50 may have more meaning as a unique, privileged institution of formation? What are the gaps? Some gaps are general, like those I touched, like uh, uh, my maestro my, my has touched, and uh, like I believe the coming presenter will touch. You know, they are the general and they are the specific ones. For, for GABA as GABA, I don't know. I only know what I mentioned that uh, the formators have not been academic enough. That I would say again and again, because it is it's clear. The others, I know I cannot give evidence in court, but I know that masking on the part of students is still here. Lack of transparency is still here. And maybe on the side of staff, I, you people were clapping when some things were mentioned, when something was mentioned. Uh, not everybody who has studied can be a formator. Maybe you know some. That's why you were clapping. So all those are there. They are, they are specific. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the same thing. All this one is the same thing. Do I need to continue? Now, Pope Benedict claiming, uh, yeah, this one we finished. Uh, 
authority that one we finished. There is development of technology. We finish. Um, oh. Wow, they are done. Eh? We are well done. But maybe I should simply say this. I'm not answering anything. By the time somebody says there is a lot of suppression, it's not a question to answer. But if it is there, if it is there, maybe let's pay attention to it. Maybe. Things don't come out for nothing. I'm not going to say there is no smoke without fire. I no longer believe in that. By the way, it's no longer true. These days, there can be smoke without fire. <laughs> oh, yes, very clearly. Very clearly. If, if you still believe there can't be smoke without fire, then you have never seen somebody who has been made to leave the seminary for impregnating a girl whom he had never as much as touched the hand. Then you have never seen that because those things happen. That they will put it onto you, you did this. Something that you don't even know. Then you say there is no smoke without fire. These days, there is a lot of smoke without fire. So, uh, I would just suggest, I would just suggest that since by doing this, we really mean to get more insights, we need to transform, if that's what we mean. When something comes out, it's like self-examination. If you are the formator who is a policeman here, even if your intentions are good, just think about it. Think about it. Just think about it. But I also know, <laughs> but I also know that some seminarians do not see a difference between freedom and license. Yeah. And of course, you don't want somebody to stop you from doing what you want to do. And at your age, by the way, can you gather here? Tomorrow you are a priest. Those of you who will not make it to the priesthood, it's not my saying it that will fail you. Yeah? Those of you who will not make it, these are the people we have in the public service. Responsible people. At this age, this is the age that has underwhelmed me by somebody still living the vocation of his mother. You know? So a person who does that, He's not going to appreciate anything that really challenges him. So some of us, when we are challenged, we call it persecution, we call it policing. Hello. But somebody who tells you, please do this, don't do this, is better than somebody who will look at you. Yeah? One time, one of my sisters-in-law asked me, does your brother really love me? I said, mm hmm He said, however much I annoy him, he does not beat me, he does not shout at me. If somebody simply looks at you, go your way, is that person interested in you? No. So why don't we begin to see things in the positive? In the positive. Somebody is saying, don't go out. Don't go out. If you go out, it can be problematic. So one who tells you not to go out, where well, you can get a problem. And one who simply looks at you and says, oh, that one who is going to follow in that ditch and looks away. Who really cares about you? So I think we should also learn to, to look at things more positively. Yeah? To look at things more positively. For a seminarian who is 28 years, to simply clap because they say they have talked about one who polices him, that is lack of seriousness, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey.
Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Joseph Chisoga.